on uh, here today. Um, so uh, within today's uh, lectures, I'm going to be um, uh, I'm going to be going and uh, covering uh, two major uh, things. Uh, the first is just to talk a little bit about the structure of the course, so you know what to expect. Um, the uh, the flow of lectures, as well as the uh, the the balance of marks and um, uh, the expectations as far as um, uh, deliverables. Um, I don't expect that will take very long, but I'd be glad to answer questions on that. Um, I uh, then will be going on to discuss uh, some of the um, the reasoning why a course like this is important, the motivations for what we're going to be talking about through the semester, both uh, as it relates to uh, data science, as it relates to functional programming, and as it relates to um, the uh, the use of Spark and affiliated technologies such as Zeppelin um, that we'll be making central use of uh, through the course. Um, so uh, I'm going to have two separate recordings for today. Uh, the first is going to focus on sort of course structure and so on, but um, uh, as I say, we'll then be transitioning to discussion instead on uh, more substantive matters rather than kind of administrative. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is, uh, some of you may know, the second time that I have taught this course. Um, uh, we did teach it uh, in the fall of 2016 as well. And um, uh, at that time, uh, we had a slightly different uh, set of technologies, but uh, technology uh, proceeds at pace. And um, this version of the course is introducing some new technologies such as Zeppelin um, and a, an additional emphasis on some aspects of social media harvesting that we didn't um, emphasize the first time around uh, nearly as much. Um, uh, I did place a syllabus for the course in the affiliated Moodle site. So if you haven't gone to Moodle yet, um, you should do so. Um, uh, so moodle.cs.usas.ca, and you should find two things. Number one, this syllabus available for download. Um, and number two, a link to uh, a YouTube playlist, which I will use for uh, populating with my videos through the term. Okay. Um, uh, the um, syllabus will probably be tweaked here and there to reflect uh, balance of time, et cetera, but um, I expect it to be uh, fairly consistent, and it provides an overview in more detail than I'll get into right now about what, what you can expect from the course, uh, et cetera. This will be a course that's distinguished by a number of features. Number one, um, it's going to be a small course. We're going to be fitting everyone in one of these rooms here. I have questions about whether ultimately we will be remaining in this room or whether we will be moving to one of the other rooms, such as the 371, where I was actually, sorry, 342, where I was actually sitting uh, prior to, to shifting over here because uh, that's, um, uh, that's where I, I thought the class was to be held. Um, uh, but wherever we are, it's, the size is not going to exceed about 12 people, okay? Um, uh, secondly, um, this is going to be a very hands-on course. And, and by that, I mean actually in a way that exceeds what you folks may have experienced in other courses, which are fairly hands-on, like 858. So we're going to be going through together simultaneously, um, synchronously, as it were, um, uh, undertaking actions uh, in uh, a variety of platforms, but most notably um, in uh, the Spark shell in Scala, um, and uh, and also uh, in Apache Zeppelin, um, probably as a host for that uh, through the semester. So we'll be f we'll be following exercises together. We'll be undertaking actions together and exploring some of the concepts that we're going to be talking about together. 
Um, so it will be very hands-on. Now, um, I, I would request that people, if possible, bring along a computer uh, to this class, okay? Um, and I will ask you to download and use um, an important uh, package or two for the sake of this course. Um, we're going to be using packages that are, are, are um, uh, available in a um, uh, component uh, fashion, um, in a containered fashion using the Docker system. Um, and Docker, as I know, something Ujia and Bopu have worked with a great deal. Um, uh, Docker basically will provide you with a way of getting already configured, self-contained um, arrangements of the technologies used in this course. The technologies used in this course are varied and they will fit together very closely. So Scala, Spark, Zeppelin, Cassandra, the database where Ethica data is stored, um, Apache Bahir um, for uh, tweet harvesting, um, and some additional technologies as well. We'll all be using those. and. You can download each of them independently and install them and configure them to work with each other. But it's actually, uh, uh, there, there's, there's some uh, work involved in that. It's not totally trivial. It's not overwhelmingly difficult, but it takes, you know, the better part of the day probably to get two or three of those technologies set up. Um, so we will be, instead of that, using um, uh, these containerized uh, systems with Docker, which are already pre-configured. So that's one reason we use that, because they're already pre-configured, okay? Number two, they have all their dependencies satisfied internally. Number three, we'll be all running the same version regardless of what operating system or platform we're using. So. I'm going to be pointing you to certain reference Docker images, which you can download to your machine. And the way Docker works is it provides you with a way of running a virtualized container, a container and kind of a virtual machine, as it were, which works exactly the same whether you're on Mac, Linux, PC, It'll work precisely, and I mean precisely the same, okay? And, um, and this is going to be important because we'll be undertaking exercises where if you installed things separately, there might be glitches. You know, you've got a Windows machine and this configured a bit differently or what have you. And by using this containerized Docker image, we're going to be all able to have the same experience, okay? So I'm going to be referring you to a um, uh, to a, a, a Docker uh, based version of Apache Spark and Zeppelin, which I'm going to ask you to download. And I think I might as well just do that right now um, to point you to this thing, um, so that you can um, uh, you can download the appropriate one. What we're going to be downloading is a, a system called Apache Zeppelin, okay? Now, it's Z-E-P-P-E-L-I-N. I can never remember if it's two L's or two P's or both. Um, but Apache Zeppelin. And if, if you go to the site for Apache Zeppelin, um, what you'll find is that it is a project that supports a wide variety of, of technologies, okay? And uh, these technologies include, most notably, Spark, um, uh, this platform for scalable data science, um, uh, but also some um, Spark uh, connectors that allow it to work with things like databases, a Cassandra database where Ethica data is stored, et cetera. Um, 
And we're going to be uh, making use of several of these technologies uh, in the course of our work. It turns out that it's also an extremely useful system for interactive exploration. And it, it provides a way of doing data analytics that, that combine the actual analysis on the one hand with visualizations, okay? Um, and uh, you'll notice that the visualizations here are supported, run in many types, and it will spare us the need to kind of write a lot of custom code to do this visualization. The visualization can be done in a very simple, interactive, visual way. Um, and there'll be a, a notebook of sorts, okay? So Zeppelin is going to be a key technology, and we're going to be, for the sake of this course, downloading um, the Docker image for for Zeppelin, okay? Now, um, I mentioned uh, why this is. It's to give us all the same experience so that everything is pre-configured. You could download Zeppelin by yourself, you could download Spark, you could download Scala, and you could wire them up to each other. But it would be a lot of work, and it would be confusing. It would be many hours of work. Um, you'd learn a lot but there's challenges here, and this course doesn't focus on those configuration challenges. Instead, what I'm going to ask you to do, and I recognize that this involves a little bit of work itself, um, but it will spare us a lot of work later, is to download this thing called uh, Docker, okay? And uh, Docker is this system for container packaging up containers um, in a way that they are self-contained, secure, um, and they are um, have sort of a common common reference. And you're going to want to download this Docker Community Edition, okay? Um, and it exists for for many different uh, platforms. Um, and you're going to want to uh, install it on your on your machine now. It turns out that Bopu here and Ujie have worked quite a lot with Docker. And so I'm going to ask them, if possible, to serve as points of reference in the lab for, uh, for getting Docker set up and for, um, for, for getting, um, getting it working with, uh, with Zeppelin. But you'll notice uh, if you go here, um, you can uh, you can go download it. It does exist for all the different platforms, which is precisely the benefit. It provides a virtual machine, which will run this container that we're going to be using for Zeppelin. We may download other containers similarly. Why am I doing this? Well, I have a subversive reason for doing this as well. Why are we going with Docker? because it turns out a lot of our lab is reorienting to use Docker as a containerized system. And UGA and Bopu have been sort of at the forefront of this with the policing analytics lab. But it also turns out Docker is, as a technology like Spark, taking the world by storm. And it will be very helpful for you to get some experience in Docker, because this is much of the way that software will be consumed in coming years is through containerized interfaces, okay? So um, this Docker Community Edition is free. You can download it, install it for the different platforms, and it runs you know, differently for different versions of, of, of Linux here. Um, once you do that, you can then you can then go and launch, using Docker, you can launch Zeppelin. And this, this actually starts to communicate some of the benefits of Docker. Because notice that I don't actually um, um, have to do anything too complex uh, for, uh, for advantages with this. Um, you can download Zeppelin separately and, and install it. But instead, what you can do is you install Docker. And Docker can run thousands of different pre-configured systems. You can get... You could say Docker, go get this system, go get that system, and it will download a pre-configured, self-contained little world for you to use. Here, you're going to be able to 
run Zeppelin for the first time using Docker, and it will take care of downloading it and installing it, sort of installing the Docker image and in a, in a totally self-contained way, okay? So I'm gonna ask you to go through those two steps for next time, okay? And I would encourage you to think about doing that during this session, is actually to, to start downloading and getting them going. On the one hand, Docker, Community Edition, and secondly, Zeppelin. Invoking it like this, it will take care of going and getting the bits and downloading it and and putting it on your computer and setting it up. And all of us will have the same experience. You'll notice we're using Zeppelin 0.7.3. Again, Windows, Mac, Linux, it'll give us all exactly the same experience. And it's going to be pre-configured to, to know how to work with Spark and Scala and Cassandra and SQL and uh, all these different uh, technologies that we'll be using. Spare you a lot of headache, okay? Um, now, in the course of the semester, I suspect that we will be using a few other Docker images. There will be a time as we approach the issue of social media harvesting where I will probably ask you to get an additional Docker image, which will be a more recent version of Zeppelin. We will no longer th use this one. We'll use a more recent one that works with Spark and something called Apache Bahir, and it's pretty configured to work with those. Um, but the point is Docker will be an ongoing resource for you in our lab as well, okay? So again, Bopu and UGL appreciate it if you can talk with anyone about um, you know questions about Docker and, and getting things set up, okay? Um, so that's going to be a uh, key component of the course is using Zeppelin, this lab notebook for Spark and Scala on Spark with these other technologies. <coughs> and uh, we'll be using them in a Dockerized uh, fashion. OK. Um, so uh, the goals of this course um, are to provide a, uh, a coverage of, um, of a special type of software engineering, building software that can scale to handle very, very large volumes of data, and spanning the gamut from interactive exploratory data analysis on the one hand where you're interactively creating these graphs in Zeppelin to graph out the data, to do charts, et cetera, all the way down to, on the flip side, production pipelines, which are used to do routine analytics on an ongoing basis, such as we might have at the police station with respect to suicide prevention or with respect to, to uh, domestic violence product, uh, protection or or opioid uh, issues, okay? And this sort of software engineering is different from the sort of software engineering many of you have explored on desktops, on mobile applications, on the web in the past. It's very resource limited. It's limited by uh, combinations of memory, processing power, and bandwidth for communication over networks. Uh, it is particularly memory intensive because of large volumes of data involved. It is uh, highly demanding in terms of collecting provenance data, knowing this result, where did it come from? How did I get here? It is also demanding in terms of um, building software that will um, that will be easy to understand while at the same time being performant, okay? These sort of needs on the data science side are huge, evolving, and there is a shortage of people who can practice it effectively and a huge demand 
throughout many areas of, of industry and government. Many of those areas our labs works with, you know, areas related to health and health behavior and its cognate areas and sort of social service delivery and justice, um, where, where these health issues are also um, key. And the world is evolving at, at, a, at a pace that's hard to express how quickly it's evolving. In the time between I delivered the first version of this course last year and now, there's been big steps taken with respect to some of these technologies. Zeppelin was not a technology we, fit, we figured that last year. Um, Apache Spark has gone through some major steps forward. Um, uh, Scala has advanced some, um, and the interfaces for harvesting Twitter data, for example, have advanced. Ethica has advanced um, uh, since then and continues to advance. And so we're dealing with uh, the cutting edge of technology here. And the class is designed to expose you to a set of technologies at the cutting edge, which will support this kind of scalable software engineering, scalable design of software to perform analyses of the sort that many of you will perform for your, for your theses, for jobs down the road. Um, and a few of those technologies are listed here. Apache Spark, Apache Zeppelin, we've seen, we've seen that, that lab notebook with visualization. In machine learning libraries, which are actually in Spark, such as the ML library, M for, ML for machine learning. These are extremely powerful machine learning tools that are composable. You have pipelines that you can define to build up ever more complex machine learning tools out of sub pieces and create these larger abstractions that do sets of work themselves, but without requiring you to know, you know, have in mind all the details about exactly all the stages within it. So ML provides this scalable framework for building up uh, quite sophisticated pipelines of, of training machine learning models and, and testing them and applying them with different sorts of machine learning algorithms to very large volumes of data. And doing so in a way that leverages many, many computers at a time and many cores. So the sorts of technologies we're talking about in Apache Spark here can be used to literally farm out computations involving analysis of big data across a lab such as lies behind many of you over there, um, just out there. You know, dozens to hundreds of machines. These technologies will let us basically take an analysis problem and divide it up in a way that allows hundreds of machines to work on it at a time and bring back the results to summarize it without us having to go and intricately um, install software uh, you know, on each machine cust custom to our application. It provides us a way of doing this transparently. So, so when you execute a command, it just automatically knows how to, how to send it out there and, and, and uh, distribute it and collect the results. And we do this through the power of Scala and uh, functional programming type approaches. So underlying all of this is Spark's native language. It's one of three languages supported by Spark, the other two being R and being Python. But Scala is its native language. It's its, its sort of native tongue. And uh, it is uh, the language in which the power of Spark is often first revealed for a new version of Spark and um, really it is, is most dramatically uh, shown in today's technologies. Now we'll be using these technologies here together with a set of external technologies that are relevant for many of you. These include technologies for Twitter data gathering, 
Um, as some of you may know, we have a very active um, program of collecting Twitter data across multiple provinces in our lab. Twitter data is self-published data. When people send things out on Twitter, it's considered a form of publishing. You're putting your thoughts into the public domain. You can sign up to be on someone's Twitter list um, uh, by, by electing to, to join it. Um, and from then on, you will get tweets delivered to you. We gather tweets for three provinces here in Canada right now, and we're going to be expanding to all provinces, um, hopefully this summer. Um, and uh, those tweets are large in volume, in velocity, in variety, and in, to some degree, veracity. So it turns out that um, we get about one, a half to one tweet per person per month for the provinces which we monitor, okay? So um, we get um, millions of tweets for Alberta, for example, each month, and we get many hundreds of thousands for Saskatchewan, and we archive them. Um, because this is self-published data, the ethics concerns here are very different than if we were gathering, say, uh, Facebook data, where we need permission of each person. Because these are self-published tweets, because they can be subscribed to by members of the public, um, we, we, uh, we, we can gather them uh, with, uh, in, in an open way, uh, and we then analyze them for uh, various patterns and various concerns. We're going to be looking at the Twitter means of doing this in Twitter, how we have searching interfaces to find tweets, streaming interfaces for, for sub connecting to the Twitter fire hose, which pumps out tens, about 10,000 tweets every second worldwide, and filtering tweets, which allow us to, to get subsets of that for regions, say, of interest or topics of interest, we can subscribe on a live basis to tweets coming in, say, for Saskatchewan. Okay. We're going to be seeing how we can do that. We'll also look at uh, some Google APIs for harvesting web search counts, and we'll look at Ethica data. Um, so data collected by the Ethica platform, um, survey data, sensor data, data volunteered by information with the buttons, cross-linking these sorts of data so we can, we can ask questions about this, the context of survey answers, for example, based on the sensor data from recent time points. So we know when someone answers it, not just where they are right now, but how much physical activity they've been getting recently, or you know, how recently they were out of the house, or, or what have you. Um, so linking up sensor data and, um, and tweet data will be important. And we'll see in that process um, some of the ways in which we can process text data, we can process semi-structured data, as well as very structured data from, from sensors. Um, so we're gonna be making use of these things. The Ethica data will be on Cassandra, um, which is a popular NoSQL database. Um, that we'll be making use of. And the Twitter data will be enabled through the use of something called Apache Bahir, which works with Spark to support um, um, uh, collecting uh, Twitter, Twitter information. Now, um, as part of doing this, we'll be spending a lot of time in Zeppelin with the Spark framework, okay? And we'll be using things like these RDDs, Resilient Distributed Data Sets, Spark Data Frames, and data sets, um, uh, which provide type safe, data sets provide type safe way of accessing types of data uh, in Scala. And we'll be seeing how we can use the mechanisms of, of Scala and of Spark to sort of uh, analyze, slice and dice this data, et cetera. Um, now, um, let's talk a little bit about infrastructure for this course, what's expected, a few resources, et cetera. So, this is a course which, as I say, is unlike probably any you've taken. Um, certainly, uh, uh, for many of you, that will be true. 
Um, it'll be highly interactive in the platforms noted, but we're also going to be making heavy use of some resources. Um, the first part of the course is going to be making particularly central use of this book, okay? Functional Programming in Scala. Um, this book is available, like all the others I'm recommending, it's available electronically through the library here. You can get access to the full text version of it, okay? And this book, unlike the others which I reference, including some who are referenced for chapters, I'm going to ask you to read it for the chapters we'll be covering, which are roughly the first half of the book, I'm going to ask you to review it quite closely. This is not, an, this is not a um, typical sort of uh, high-level textbook. There's some deep stuff in here. And I expect you to be challenged by this book because there's some um, challenging concepts, notions, uh, uh, practice. And I'm going to ask you to go through it pretty much chapter by chapter, uh, starting with chapter one next time and, and running up through chapter six here, um, functional programming in Scala through chapter six. We're going to be talking about a variety of, of concepts and, and uh, features of functional programming that are quite central Many of them are quite central to its use in Spark. And, and I think all of them, to some degree, play an important role for uh, motivating the very large um, role of functional programming in data science that we're seeing now. Okay? Um, now, this is a graduate course. And it's a course where we're meeting twice a week. And you'll notice that these chapters, we're going to be going through, through those fairly quickly. So sometimes this will mean needing to review two chapters in the course of a week. Okay? So be sure, to, be sure to allocate time. As I said, you will be challenged by this book. I will be working to guide you through many of the, the key concepts with this from those chapters. We will be talking about some of the detailed content from those chapters. So it's very important that you read the book and that you stay current with it. And I believe you'll gain a lot from that and can gain a lot of insights from it that will be applied in the later part uh, of this course. Okay. Um, so so this, this book is different. I'm going to ask you to go through it in detail in a in a fairly scripted way for the first bunch of lectures. Now you'll notice in this um, weekly outline, I provide a weekly outline. This is a, a weekly defined weekly outline where weekly, the first weekly is W-E-A-K-L-Y. Um, in other words, I may be spending two lectures on this chapter three. I may be spending, you know, um, one lecture on chapter four. And I'll try to guide you as to how long I spent, I'm going to be spending. So like, are we going on to a new chapter next time? So you can read it, okay? But we'll be, we'll be going through this pretty quickly. This is foundational understanding. By and large, for this first part of the book, we're going to be secretly operating in Spark. But you won't really be exercising th the real power of Spark yet. We'll be using Spark as a convenient place to run Scala, okay? In, um, uh, in the Zeppelin shell. We're going to then have quite a transition for the later part of the course to focus in. So this is probably, maybe it'll be about a third of the class onward. Maybe it'll be, in a, sorry, in other words, starting one third of the way through the class, between a third and a half, I think. We're gonna be shifting our frame of reference to really focus in on Spark in particular as a, as a framework for, for building these programs in Scala and for conducting data analysis. And we're going to go through a whirlwind tour of different features of Spark and, and use of Spark together with data collection mechanisms such as on Twitter 
and such as on um, uh, such as from uh, search data from Ethica from data sources of text so analyzing text data which are a source of, of large data we're gonna be doing text analytics like you might do on Twitter or you might do on on you know contents from web pages that were harvested um, and um, uh, we'll spend a particular time there just making sure people are solid about Ethica data use. Um, and, uh, and you'll see how, how useful a tool this, this can be for doing large queries on Ethica. This is not an optional thing, it turns out. So ladies and gentlemen, as some of you know, UN, UN uh, has, has memory back earlier than than uh, just about anyone in this room. Um, our UN was involved, I think, in the first version of our data sensing system, right? I think it, it, you may have helped out with charging those little modes, right? Yeah, um, our first mobile data collection system, um, 2009, 2010. We, we worked for a long time with the data collected by that system. First by that, and then by smartphone-based data collection with IEPI, um, uh, with Muhammad and, and Dylan Knowles and others, we collected large volumes of data. And for many years, we actually analyzed this data in Postgres SQL or in Microsoft SQL Server or in at one point, it was in, I think, MySQL. Um, and these databases did okay for a while. But we found, like many practitioners working with big data found, that at a certain point, that was, that was a road we could not continue down. The latency for executing queries was just getting extreme. You might run a query overnight it might time out, it might encounter an error after many, many hours of processing. And uh, Mohammed, in, in creating the infrastructure for Ethica, reflective of this, needed to put in place an infrastructure for this kind of newest version, as it were, of the, the IEPI project, put in place a Cassandra database. Turns out Cassandra is up to the task of very rapid queries, but it's very difficult to process on its own terms. Where it really shines is with Spark and uh, using the Spark platform with Scala, you could transparently access Cassandra databases in a way that's performant it takes advantage of memory caching and, and uh, uh, effective reuse of results, et cetera. But at the same time, uh, it is um, very transparent, very straightforward to write. So now, you know, we do very little amount of our work with the smartphone collected data with a, with a, a traditional SQL database. It's, not, it's all no SQL. And that pattern mirrors the learning that's gone on in many companies and elsewhere when they work with big data. A lot of the technologies that they've been used to, their cherished code bases in R, their, their code bases in you know, Python, uh, not using Spark and in, in, um, in Java or what have you, in SQL, they don't scale well to very, very, very large data sources without a set of new technologies. And that's what Spark provides. So we're not using this because it's fun and new, although it is those things. We're using it because we have no other option to do performant data analysis. And this is true for a wide fraction of the industry. It doesn't hurt that you folks get training at the cutting edge of technologies that are extraordinarily high demand as part of this. Now, so we're gonna be going through this and uh, we're going to be using Scala as a natural 
standpoint for, for doing functional programming here um, uh, because it, it enables us to do these sort of analyses. Let's talk a little bit about what's expected from you in the deliverable um, sense. Really what we're talking about is three types of contribution where two of them are overwhelmingly uh, dominant. One of them is a set of at-home at exercises, okay? We don't have a TA for this course. There's no, there's no TA for this course. I do all the marking. And um, to make that sustainable, um, when, when I proposed this course to the department and it was approved, one of the things uh, I put my emphasis is on something that, that's really proved useful in other courses, and that is take home exercises that will help this flip classroom experience. Those who have taken 858 recently will remember this. Um, uh, I use it as well for 470, 816. I don't think anyone in here was uh, took that course uh, recently. Yuan took it way back in the day, I think, before this innovation. Um, basically, these will be little challenges for you, okay? And what I'm gonna ask you to do is to view these as a challenge, and I'm asking you to meaningfully engage with this challenge. I'm not asking you necessarily to solve it, although it's great if you can. And many of you, many of them you will probably solve. But that's not the point. The, the point is to struggle with it. So that when we talk about that material in our next lecture, you've recognized where your stumbling blocks are. You've recognized where you got stuck, where you couldn't make progress. And you'll see, you'll absorb more completely the solution that gets you around those blocks. Oh, that's how he does it. Okay. Yeah. That's how it's done. Um, so that would be uh, a key part is to pursue these exercises. So I would ask of you, I would entreat you, please do not spend more than an hour or two on these each. Okay. I'll give them out thick and fast. There's probably going to be at least one a week. I don't want you to spend overnight on it. I don't want you to spend, you know, six hours on it. Spend an hour or two struggling with it. Get as far as you can. Turn it in. Turn it in before class the next day. I will mark it pass-fail. The pass is just, did you engage seriously with it? Did you struggle with it? Did you hand it in, most importantly? Um, so it's an easy win. You know, even if you don't solve it, if you're struggling with it, meaningfully working with it, you'll get a pass. I just want to see evidence you, you tried. Okay? Um, so that's, that's almost half the class. Additionally, and critically, there's a project. Okay? Now, the project varies from person to person. I have a set of proposed projects from last year, and some of them are still relevant, and I could trot out others. Students have pursued very different types of projects. Some of these projects that are suitable are data analysis projects. And in fact, the project description below kind of by default assumes a data analysis project. So, you know, you want to take Twitter data and you want to classify cases of people who are plausibly uh, reporting depression or people who, who are um, reporting a workplace injury, something like that. Um, and so you want to develop a machine learning classifier that will run over Twitter data and allow you to automatically classify um, cases which 
uh, are likely to be serious tweets from one perspective or another, like like it's a case of workplace injury or it's a case of depression or someone who's uh, talking about an actual case of flu that's likely to be in the province. And um, as some of you know, we've done that very successfully in certain domains for recognizing people talking seriously about suicide, for people talking about, uh, 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 about uh, certain infectious diseases. Um, some of my students, Xiaoyan, for example, has done a great job with machine learning classifiers. That was a project for this course, okay? Another one would be to work with particle filtering using social media data. Anahita did this last year, actually. She did it with search data. So looking when people were searching historically for flu, at the same time there was a, a flu outbreak, she used a machine learning approach called particle filtering together with a dynamic model of flu transmission that further incorporated transmission of anxiety about flu. And she um, used that to, to improve the performance of the particle filtering compared to if it only used clinical data. Using clinical data, particle filtering helped a great deal compared to an unassisted model. Using particle filtering and data from search queries, like how many people were searching for flu-related things over time, she was able to improve it quite dramatically. It's ironic, because to the standpoint of many of my health partners, that sort of search data will be considered low on the evidence hierarchy, the evidence pyramid that UN has been exposed to. Um, it's considered low quality evidence, but it turns out it, it helps a great deal when combined with this analytic technique of particle filtering, dynamic modeling, and combined with uh, this higher quality data of, of um, uh, concerning uh, clinical uh, diagnoses. Um, because there's different information in it. Someone could do the same thing with Twitter this time. We didn't have Twitter. So Twitter data is not historically archived in a accessible fashion without paying big bucks through your nose. Last year, students from this class tried to get historic Twitter data for an outbreak. Anahita did. Um, the company, there's a company that, that archives Twitter data. They have a relationship with Twitter. They wanted to charge something like $1,000 for a week worth of data for a given region. We have data for the past year. Using techniques built in this class last year, we have data for the past year on three provinces in Canada. You could go back over that and find time periods where there's an outbreak of flu or something like that and look at Twitter-related data. So analysis is one type of project. Another type of project people have pursued is more software engineering project. This is a little bit like Bopu and Udye's project uh, for this past term, actually. So people have talked about maybe building an HMM, a hidden Markov model classifier for Spark, for example. So you create a transformer, it's called in Spark, which is a a machine learning model, and it allows us to, to, to perform HMMs in Spark, which are not currently supported by Spark. In contrast, things like support vector machines, decision trees, um, logistic regression, uh, artificial neural networks, those are supported by Spark, HMMs are not currently. Um, doing work with CCM on Spark. Someone did some work with that, using Spark and CCM together for the first time. That work came out of this class. Um, those would be examples of other projects. Um, some people have basically focused their projects around analysis of data sets. An example might be, you know, if Nell wanted to analyze incoming data from veterans that's coming in for the first few months, um, using the tools from this class, you know, using some Spark and visualization in that and maybe exporting some data to Tableau and, and R, um, that would be a worthy project here too, okay? So projects come in various forms. In my 
and and uh, down below I give a description of project deliverables that I'm looking to have at different part times of the course and kind of a breakdown. But be aware that this is like oriented towards data set analysis. If you wanted to do software development, you want to develop a spark harness for HMMs or for you know for for to advance the CCM stuff further to do additional analysis we'll work together to adapt this so that you can have deliverables along the way that are adapted for your project so don't get too caught up in that okay um now one thing though that we will have to face is deliverables for the project so i'm going to ask you to aspire to turn in your report on, or at least close to the final day of class, okay? Um, please, for my sake, for your sake, please turn it in. You don't want Christine hunting you. Um, uh, so we have some projects from this class last year that have yet to be turned in. <laughs> um, Sometimes I have to speak with Winchell about his, I think. Um, but Winchell made much of this class possible last year, so it may just be his project is delivering the class or something like that. So in any case, um, let's, let's not drag it out that far. You know, I'm willing to give some flexibility. I know s several of you are in other classes right now, um, 826 or others. And I'm willing to be a bit flexible, but let's not have it go many, many, many months. Okay, we can we can turn it in. The project can be small; it doesn't have to be very big. It doesn't have to be the final word on it. You can develop it afterwards. But let's see if we can get it in in the April time frame, so that I can mark it and get you good grades and and you know um, get you uh, get your record in good standing. Okay, because um, otherwise it stays on there as an incomplete failure, you know, for a year or something like that. Okay, um, and I mentioned take-home exercises. Um, let's see, are there any other? No, I think that's, that's basically a description of what's uh, intended for this course. This is going to be um, um, a, a very uh, cozy class and, and uh, you know, we'll work together to make sure that it it meets learning objectives for the different students in the class. And if you want to make it a cozy class with, with another visitor, I'm happy to do that. Um, so um, anyway, that's that's the picture of the class, a, a brief portrait. Does anyone have questions about this? This is again available on Moodle. Iman, I don't know if you've been on Moodle before since you haven't taken a class. So if you go to moodle.cs.usas.ca, if you go to log in on Moodle, um, you will you want to do that the first time because it turns out the first time you logged in, you log in, I think some gears turn. Um, like in other words, I think your account gets created and then that gets linked up probably overnight with this course and then you're given access to the course. But I think the first step of that, I think it's a somewhat asynchronous process. You like go log in for the first time and then like a day later you got access or something. I may be wrong, but I would urge you to, to try to log in um, early and then log in often, okay? Yes, um, okay. Uh, the class will be recorded as I am want. Um, uh, I will be posting videos, screencasts, on uh, YouTube on an ongoing basis, and um, and this is the URL for it. It just points to a playlist on YouTube, which I'll be populating starting today. Okay? If you don't see a video and you want it there, just bother me and chances are I have to go upload it or something like that. I will probably start to do live events as well so people can attend this course live remotely um, and those have attracted some following so I think I'll, I'll do some of that. Um, one thing I will say is the other books are very good. I have a set of them 
If people would like to try borrowing them, you could take a look. They provide us a lot of hands-on material um, for the course, um, including the use of Zeppelin, et cetera. Just be aware that these books uh, were written, you know, at certain points in time, and Spark has evolved some, but they're quite useful, and uh, you're welcome to look at them, but they're all available electronically through the library. So any questions? Questions about this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, for this one? Yeah, so th this is interesting. So thank you for raising that. Because I found that same thing when I searched for it originally. You need to, s you need to search for... Um, <laughs> okay, that's, that's great. Um, I was actually, I just realized there was another book. So Scala in functional, okay, so it sounds like you did that. Yeah, I had, I had some issues with this last year, but I think we found a way to deal with that. Yeah, so, um, hmm. Okay, I'll look into that, but it sounds like Bopu is. Yeah, I've found it and downloaded it. Okay. La Marche or two. Um, okay, that's great. Um, uh, th th that's great. So um, I, will, I will see, though, um, uh, the more typical way in which it's, um, in which it's found, because uh, we did find it last year. Um, through one mechanism or another, okay? Um, okay, yeah, other questions? Is Spark Access 2013 the one you have up to 2013? Let me, let me double check that. I'm wondering if, if uh, it's been um, updated. Um, this is 2015. Um, Okay, so uh, why don't I look into that, and I'll see if we can get you the 15 version. I do actually remember, yes, there was an upgrade to the book, and it's probably worth uh, looking at. Um, okay, other questions? Okay, so uh, hearing no questions, I'm going to save this recording.